What's up, big dog? Have you ever had your athletes, or if you are a pass rusher or a defense alignment, period, have you ever gotten a season and you tend to start forgetting some of the stuff you worked on in the offseason? The pass rush moves you worked on, dealing with the double team, reach blocks, RPOs, your best pass rush moves, your go-tos, your counters, all that stuff you worked so hard for in the offseason, you tend to start forgetting. This is why for my coaches and athletes, this is why Zooms are very important. A lot of times with your teams, you may only get about 10 to 15 minutes in film with your positional coaches, but you don't always get a full hour of breakdown where you get to really break down yourself, what you did on that rush, what you did on that play, where your hands were, where your feet were, did you make the right choices, your pre-snap reads, all those things you don't always get a chance to really break that down on your own pace and at your own time. This is why with my NFL guys, college and high schoolers, we do in-season Zooms. When I was an athlete, I wish I had that. I wish I had something to where I can actually take my time, ask all the dumb questions I needed to ask so that on my pace and in my time, I could fully understand what I needed to do, what I needed to fix, and how I could fix it. Big Dog, I highly recommend for you to have an in-season Zoom session, and I would love to help you. Go to bigdogfootball.com, and you're going to see Zoom in-season sessions. Click there. Let's set up. Let's get together, and let me help you be the best dog you can be at the line of scrimmage. You know what time it is. Let's go to work. 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 Let's work. Work, work, work. What's up, Big Dog? This is Coach Roll, and we are back in the lab with Big Dog Trench Talk. There were some great games this past weekend, a lot of great college football games, great NFL games. One in particular that I watched from beginning to end was Georgia versus Alabama. That was a great game. If you did not watch that game, Big Dog, I would highly recommend you go watch that game. Both teams show great character. They show great fight, um, especially, I don't want to ruin it for you if you didn't see it, um, but the effort from both teams, I'll just say that, um, one in particular being down X amount of points, to come back like that at the end was fantastic. I just love watching big dogs fight up front. I love watching teams fight to the very end. And that was a perfect example of teams fighting to the very end. And I love that. That's what football should be about. The teams, though, that won or lost was because of gap control. The lack of gap control. Big dogs up front having the ability to control their gap or not having the ability to control their gap. And that's what today's topic is about. And this actually was a question from the coaches and always a topic or a question from the athletes, especially in the offseason, which is, how do I best control my gap? And so the question was posed in this way. How do we teach players to maintain their gap responsibilities and understand their role in different schemes? That is a very important question, and especially in the summertime, when I have my second tier of training, I'm out of the foundational fundamental phase of training and I transition into my second tier, which is more scheme specific development. The thing that I always ask all my athletes is, what is your defense? Are you a 4-3? Are you a 4-4, a 5-2, a 3-3? What is the formation of your defense? What is the personnel of the box? And what is the DNA? What is the makeup of the defense? What is your objective? What is the job that you have? I need to know that so that I can better teach my athletes um, how to do the best job that they can of executing their responsibility. Um, and so this is a very important topic because, again, we know that in order for you to win a football game, you have to win at the line of scrimmage. I'm going to keep saying it. Because it's facts. I don't care how good your linebackers are. I don't care how good you are with your coverage. The game starts at the line of scrimmage. 
the athlete on the football field that has the ball first is the center. And the athlete at the line of scrimmage that is across from him most of the time, it is a defensive lineman or a linebacker nowadays with some of the things they're doing in the scheme. Those are the two, to me, very important, if not the most important players on the field is the center and that nose tackle or whoever is in front of that center, depending on the scheme. I know the center doesn't have the ball for long, but he has to deliver that ball. If he does not deliver that ball, there is no play. So if you are not winning at the line of scrimmage, if you can't control your gap, you probably are losing at the line of scrimmage. If an offense is doing a good job of causing a defensive line to lose gap control, chances are the offense is winning. With their passing game, with their run game, the offense is winning. Now, if the defensive line is doing a great job with gap control, they are pass rushing in their pass rush lanes, which to me is still a form of gap control. Chances are they are winning the game. Chances are they are controlling the pace of the game. Three downs and they are off the field. Turnover on down, giving the offense more chance at the score by getting off the field on third down and giving the offense back the ball on fourth down and special teams. Most of the time, that's what's happening. If you have great gap control, starting with your defense alignment up front. And so, again, this was a very important question because the question was, how do we teach players to maintain their gap responsibilities? The key is, how do we teach players to maintain? And that's a good question because typically that's the problem. It's not always what is my responsibility. It's not necessarily what is my gap. I, I'll just go out there and say that if not most all athletes at the line of scrimmage know their alignment, they know their assignment, and they know their gaps. So it's not always knowing but it's maintaining. That's the challenge. Maintaining the gaps. So we're going to talk about that first because it's crucial. It is crucial. If you want to win football games, the dogs up front or whoever you have at the line of scrimmage, you may walk a linebacker down, slide the D-line over. I'm not sure. Under, over, 50, front, 40, whatever your choice of weapon is. They have to learn to maintain their gaps at the line of scrimmage or else we're not stopping anything. And if we can't stop the run, we can't have no fun. If the offense is running the ball and controlling the clock, offense, your offense isn't getting that ball back no time soon. And most of the time, whoever has the ball the longest, most of the time, is probably going to end up winning that game unless your defense is scoring or your special teams are scoring. So it starts with gap control up front. So I want to talk about how do we teach it? What are some things that need to be taught in order to actually maintain gap control? With all the years that I have been coaching on all levels, NFL, college, and pro, and working with guys in the offseason, most of the time the reason why there is a challenge when it comes to gap maintenance or maintaining your gap is because there isn't always an understanding of how the box is being played. Coaches, athletes, coaches, do you teach the box? Athletes, do you understand the box? Depending on what level we're talking about, you know, more so youth and high school and sometimes even college, there isn't a full understanding of box play. We know that when it comes to the run game, it is the defensive box versus the offensive box. Typically, that's what we're looking at. How many um, defensive players do we have in our box and how are we trying to match that against how many offensive players is in their box? So just so that we're on the same page. A lot of you may know this already, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. If I'm a defensive guy and I'm looking at the offensive box, what is the offensive box that I'm playing against? 
So let's paint this picture. The offensive box starts at the line of scrimmage. The line of scrimmage is the base of the box. The base of the box is the line of scrimmage. The widest lineman, and if there is a 11 or a 21 or 22, now we're talking the tight end. Whether it be the widest lineman or the widest or the tight end, they form the side of the box. So that offensive tackle or that tight end now forms the side of the box. So we have the base of the box is the um, line of scrimmage, and then we have the sides of the box or the width of the box now is the offensive of tackle or the tight end. Sometimes the Y off, um, they form the side of that box. The top of the box or the back of the box is now the deepest back. To me, that's why we call them a quarterback, running back. It's one of the reasons why we call them backs because they are located at the back of the box. So when you look at the line of scrimmage as being the base, the widest lineman or tight end, and the deepest back, running back or quarterback, that is now my box. Defensively speaking, very, very similar. The line of scrimmage at the base of my defensive box, um, the widest defensive end, sometimes that outside backer may be right outside that defensive end. They form the width of the box, such as a tight end on the offensive side, and the deepest back, the linebacker. The linebacker is now the, the depth of the box or the top of the defensive box if you're looking from an offensive standpoint. So you have the defensive box versus the offensive box, and this is why a lot of times a quarterback will come to the line of scrimmage and he will count the box. How many is in the defensive box? If it's five, if it's six, or whatever the offensive scheme is, depending on how many people are in the defensive box, we may run the ball, we may play action, we may have to pass. If it's eight in the box, if it's nine in the box, there may be some mismatches somewhere, we are outnumbering them somewhere, and it's a numbers game. Football is a numbers game. And so now it's, it's the defensive box versus the offensive box. There's so much to that. It's the game within the game. And I haven't even scratched the surface. For those of you offensive geniuses out there and defensive geniuses, and I know there's a ton because there's a lot of information out there, but you know what I'm saying. And so a lot of times the defensive linemen up front don't always know the box. They don't realize that it is the defensive box versus the offensive box. They think that it is just me versus him. They think that it is just defensive end versus offensive tackle. Or they think that it is just nose tackle versus center. Um, they think that it is just me versus you. And that's not true. When you talk about teaching guys how to maintain the gap, it starts with the understanding of the box. It is my crew versus your crew. It is my team versus your team. And when you, when you explain and break down the box, then athletes realize that I'm not doing this by myself. It is us versus you all. And offensive linemen do a great job at that. You will hear them say, if you listen closely during an NFL game, they'll say, you two versus them two. Us two versus those two. Quarterback will say, you two got those two. They'll, they'll point it out. They'll make it plain. They don't care, you know, that they know defensively, hey, we, us two, we got you two. They don't care because they know that it is the offensive box that is attacking the defensive box. We are a team. And so gap control, to me, first starts with teaching especially the guys up front, box play. And when they understand the box play, now in teaching the box play, this is where we start to now break down the box order. How does our defensive box defend their offensive box? 
right? When I played in college, the one thing that I learned right off the bat when I first got to the University of Florida, I learned from those guys up front, the older guys, they said to me right off the bat, the defensive line sets the tone of the defense. The dogs up front set the tone of the defense. We set the tone. It starts with us. What we do up front and what we get established up front, the backers then fill in. The backers now know their run fits. The backers now see a hole, fill a hole. But we have to up front make sure we are in our gaps and squeezing the bubbles. We are squeezing the gaps that remain so that that linebacker, it's almost impossible for him to miss a tackle because we, we turn that gap into a crack. But all that starts up front. The order of the box and the way we attack, it starts with the defensive line. Some defenses have changed that responsibility and they've made the linebackers the order of the box. They are the primary order of the box. And just my opinion, I disagree with that. I feel that the same way a running back has a hard time without a great offensive lineman, I feel, just my opinion, that linebackers will have a hard time without the execution of the defensive line. The defensive line need to know that they set the tone in the defensive box, that what we do up front, eating two on a double team, getting knocked back on a guard, squeezing, spilling, boxing, that stuff starts up front. And when we execute up front at the line of scrimmage, talking to my defensive linemen and linebackers that may have walked down if there's a tight end, depending on your scheme, we win and lose at the line of scrimmage. And so that's where it starts. That is the order of the box. And the second level comes in a little later. The second level comes in, not talking about if you're being blitzed, but the second level comes in later because they are four yards back or five yards back or wherever you might be. But them dogs up front are attacking and executing first, and the linebackers now flow and fit in their gaps. We can't be playing at the line of scrimmage hoping that the linebackers make plays, that the linebackers make tackles. They will when you do what you're supposed to do up front, when you dominate and execute what you're supposed to do within the order of the box. Those guys up front, the line of scrimmage, have to take care of business first, and then the linebackers now fit into what remains, pin on the floor of the ball. Outside the box, inside the box, pin on what the offense is doing. Hopefully those dogs up front will funnel the ball where it's supposed to go, okay, which is to another player. We'll get to that later. But teaching guys to maintain their gaps, in my opinion, starts with understanding the box and the order of attack within the box. I think that's very important. Um, the second thing that I would teach is the triangle. It's important for, again, in talking about the order of attack of the box, who's attacking first, who's flowing second, who's fitting, or gap exchange that sometimes have to happen. That triangle needs to be taught. When I say triangle, let me give you an example. So if you have a 4-3 defense, let's keep it simple. It's a 4-3 defense, and let's say looking at this from, a, from, a, from the defensive side of the ball, it's a 4-3, college 4-3, strong right. So the three technique goes to the strength in this example. Not always the case, but it's in, in this example. Three technique goes to the strength. So the three technique is a B-gap threat. The nose tackle is a A-gap threat on the other side of the center. Then you have your two defensive ends. Let's say there's no tight end. So it's two defensive ends and their five technique. So we now, when we talk about the triangle, we are now breaking the box down even more. There are points of attack within the box. So there are points of attack within the box. Here's the game. 
You have the football field. You have the 50, right? You have one side of the 50 and the other side of the 50, which to me is a form of a box. Then you have a smaller box, which is the offensive box and the defensive box. And then you have a smaller box, which in this example would be, follow me now, nose tackle to D tackle to the Mike Backer. That triangle within that smaller box is an attacking try. It's an attacking triangle within that smaller box. You see what I'm saying? It's there are multiple boxes that's happening. And the smallest box is then nose tackle against center. Three technique against guard. Right? Mike Backer filling the hole. Now it's body on body. Now it's technique, it's hands, play, it's leverage and execution, all that stuff. And we kind of jump to how do we beat the guy in front of us, not understanding how the game of football is about identifying and understanding these boxes and this attacking triangle. So the triangle in this defense, nose tackle, that's the A-gap threat, D tackle, that's in the B gap, and you have your mic that's five yards off the ball that might be in a 10 or a 20i. And a 10 is where the one technique would be five yards off the ball. A 20i would be where the 2i would be, but 20 just means five yards off the ball. So that's the triangle, nose to D tackle to the mic, and it forms a triangle. If the nose tackle can maintain his point in the triangle, if the D tackle can maintain his point in the triangle, we are now funneling, depending on what kind of offensive play this is, but just for the sake of example, we are now funneling the running back to the mic. If he can hold his point in the triangle, we can be an attacking try. An attacking try. Does that make sense? We have to teach them that it's not about making all the tackles. That the glory of a defense is not necessarily about making all the sacks. But are you disciplined enough to hold your point in the tribe? Are you disciplined enough to hold your point of the triangle? Because if you can attack your triangle and hold your point in your tribe, it becomes very difficult as an offensive team to now execute anything when guys at the line of scrimmage and in their box are holding their points of the triangle. That's very important because then it doesn't necessarily become about how many tackles I'm making, how many sacks I'm making. Though that's cool, though that's great to try to accomplish. But it's only great to try to accomplish a lot of TFLs and sacks and tackles. That's cool. But when it supersedes the triangle, when your stats supersede the triangle play, then this is when we run into maintaining gap control. Because you don't want to maintain gap control if you are in pursuit of more tackles, of more sacks, of more TFLs, you're playing selfish ball because you're not trying to hold your point of the triangle. You're trying to just make a bunch of plays and tackles. At that point, there is no team. You're doing your own thing. But when you talk about a team now, when you talk about 11 guys equaling one, when you talk about triangles being, being attacking and working together, you're talking about a real tight-knit team that's functioning as one, and it becomes very difficult 
to be successful. And that's what you see when you see great games, when you see great defenses, they understand their triangle. And they attack as a try. They don't attack independently, individually. They attack as a try. Guys need to understand that they are a part of a triangle. And there are multiple triangles in the box. There might be the three technique and the defensive end and the outside backer. That's one try. That try overlaps the D tackle, nose, and Mike. That's the middle try. That's attacking the middle box. And then you have the nose technique, the five technique, and the outside backer. Just keeping it simple. That is the other side of the try. When you have those three triangles attacking, then you are dominating at the line of scrimmage. You are relocating the line of scrimmage. You are squeezing the offensive lineman's back to the quarterback. You are squeezing on that backside space because you got three triangles attacking with their triangles, giving very little room and space for the running back to work. That is, that is how you play defense. When every athlete in the box understands their point in the triangle, and is disciplined enough to hold their point in the triangle, you're going to have guys up front maintain their gap control because they know that their point in the triangle will assure, will assure success at the line of scrimmage and they can just hold their point of an attack and try. That's number two. That is very important. Number three, the, the biggest thing when it comes to, again, teaching guys how to maintain their gap control, the challenge in that becomes maintaining their gaps, right? How do athletes lose their gaps? How do they, how do they end up not maintaining them? And I kind of mentioned it before, and this plays alongside of not being, not wanting to sacrifice. When an athlete understands their box, when they understand the order in which the box functions and works, when they understand the triangles, how the triangles attack within the box, at that point, having a successful defense simply becomes how well can I execute my point within the triangle? How well can I do my job? How well can I fulfill my role and play my role within this? That I understand that I have a role within the run game. I have a role within the box. That is my job. And if I can just do my job, if I can do my part and maintain my gap leverage, and maintain my role and, and responsibility, now I'm going to do an excellent job of making a lot of plays. Now, I'm not necessarily saying making a lot of tackles. I didn't necessarily say make a lot of sacks. I didn't necessarily say make a lot of TFLs. But I'm making all kind of plays. Why? Because when I sacrifice and I'm playing selflessly, I am now funneling the ball to whether – it be a linebacker who makes the tackle, a defensive end who makes the tackle because of me. I am now funneling the ball to flow to a to the to the attacking part of the triangle, to the tip of that triangle. I'm funneling the ball now. I'm telling the ball where I wanted to go because I'm sacrificing um, and I am doing a good job of making sure I play my role and I funnel that ball. I'm trying to trap the rat. I'm trying to track the back and trap the rat. That's how I like to say it. If I can just funnel, either I'm going to either make this play, which in this case make a tackle, or I'm going to make the play by redirecting and funneling the ball to go where I know where my linebacker is, 
where I know where my dog is, my nose tackle is. I know where my defensive end is going to be. I know that they are playing their points of the try. And when I do my job and I funnel the, the ball, I funnel the flow of the ball to my teammate, I know they're going to be there to make the play. And this leads me to my next point. For those athletes that are mature football players and they've been playing for a long time, just watched a couple NFL games Sunday and Monday, and it just blows my mind sometimes how elite, elite defensive linemen, linebackers, elite players, professional, the best in the world at what they do, how they lose gap control, how they lose containment. I don't get it. How they lose their gaps. I know it's easier said than done. I understand. I play professionally as well, and the game is faster, and there's a lot more pressure to make plays. I understand all of that. But the teams that thrive the most – and they win more often, I should say, are the teams that play as a team. The teams that know their roles within the scheme, they have accepted that role, and they know that their role within the scheme is significant. They know that there is no defense without their role, and they take the role of the scheme seriously that I must do my job and there's nobody better than me to do my job. But I also accept the fact that my job is a part, it is a part of the defense. My job is not the defense. My job is a part of the defense. And it allows the other parts of the defense to thrive and succeed and function as one. When you think that your role is bigger than the defense, or when you think that what you do is the defense and you are carrying the defense, that's where we start to lose more than gap control. We don't lost more than gap control because at this point you think that you are 11 people. You think that you can be everywhere at once. You a beast. You Superman. You the Flash. And you can be in 11 places at one time. When it gets to that point, you have lost something that is crucial to what a team is. You know what that is, big dog? I'm going to tell you. The T... And team is trust. You can say that you are a team all you want. But the first letter in team, I will say it means trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have a team. You don't have it. You don't have it. If I don't trust that if I play my role and I do my job, and I funnel the quarterback or I funnel the running back to my teammate, if I don't trust that they're going to make that play, then I'm going to make that play myself. Not only am I going to funnel the running back, but I'm going to be the person that I funnel him to. I'm going to funnel him to myself. You ever seen a basketball play, uh, player um, pass the ball to himself? You ever seen a basketball player throw the ball off the backboard and pass it to their self. Yes, that shows incredible amount of skill. It's cool. Awesome to watch. I get all of that. But it does not show teamwork. We all just standing here watching how magnificent you are. That's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. I understand if it's, you know, you playing a game of basketball on the street. I understand if you are doing a slam dunk contest. That's cool. But within a official basketball game, within an actual 
not an exhibition, not an all-star game, within an actual season play to do something like that, to me that just doesn't demonstrate team. And sometimes we see the same thing in football a lot. That one guy's role, he thinks that his role is the defense or it is bigger than the defense. That he is the face of the franchise, he is the face of the program, and he's carrying the defense on his shoulders, so therefore he's got so many responsibilities and so many things that he has to do, and he's trying to do it all by himself because he's the guy. That's where a lot of defenses fall. That's where a lot of defenses fall. I'm going to put it like this. The lack of trust is the death of a defense. The lack of trust is the death of a defense. Now, I'm not saying that you've got some great players out there and they can stop an offense, you know, by themselves. Not for four quarters. It will never happen. But, yeah, you got some guys that will make some big plays and at, 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 at big moments, at crucial moments. Yeah, I understand that. But just because, you know, a pass rusher beats that off of the tackle, I don't know, two times in a row. Or just because he had a fantastic pass rush move, it was nice, it was a, it was a strip sack, turned into a touchdown, and all that stuff, big time play. I'm not saying that that's not – amazing and, and, and to be honored and, and to be applauded. I'm not saying that. But it's only so far you can go without a team. It's only so many of those plays that are going to happen without a team. That's the problem. Most, all, most games, I would venture to say all games, all games ask this question. Which team is a team? Because the team that is more consistently playing as a team will probably end up winning a football game or will probably end up going the furthest in the season or could possibly end up winning it all. It's not that they have more big plays than other teams. It's not necessarily that they have more fancy sacks and more amazing TFLs than other teams. They might have gone the distance because they were the ones that proven to be more consistent as a team. They're, they are the team that show more trust, more consistent trust in their teammates within the game. Because let me tell you something, consistent trust which leads to consistent team play, ultimately ends in team wins. I'm going to say it one more time. Consistent trust in teammates, which leads to more team play, ultimately leads to more team wins. I'm just telling you. So when it comes to why we lose gap control. Trust is number one. There isn't enough trust in their teammates. And sometimes there is no trust in the coach. I don't trust my coach. My coach don't know what he's talking about. What does my coach know? You know, it's, it's crazy how sometimes the athlete knows more than the coach especially on the youth and the high school level, that's, it's too much of that. And on the college level, on the pro level, I don't think what you're saying is right. I don't think what you're saying is accurate. And sometimes you've got some elite NFL players that really know their stuff. And the coaches don't always believe what the athlete is trying to tell them they're seeing on the field. That's why you got iPads on the sideline that changed a long time ago when you had that iPad. You had the eye in the sky, but then the eye in the sky turned into the eye right there on the sideline because we got the iPads now. 
If you don't have an iPad, I recommend you get one on the sideline because athletes are visual learners and it helps them see and correct and make changes. But when an athlete does not trust their coach, that's the problem. We can't grow like that. We can't learn that like that. If your coach can't teach you, if your coach can't train you, if your coach can't criticize you in a way that helps growth and progress, if you're not coachable and you don't trust your coach, big dog is only so far you can go. Individually, as a unit, it's only so far your growth is stunted because you don't have any trust in your coach and in your teammates. This is why gaps control is not maintained. Because ultimately, if an offense is moving the ball, they're moving the chains, and all of a sudden athletes start saying, man, I'm going to just do what I got to do to, to stop. It ain't working. What the coach calling ain't working. Let the coach make that change. Get back to the sideline and show him or show them that I did exactly what you asked me to do and it's not working. Let them make that call. You all come together and make that decision. But when you start making your own choices and your own decisions and you start coming up with your own solutions, you're not necessarily thinking about how that offsets everybody else and you quickly make your own choices and decisions and you do what you think is best for you and what's best for the team, it just goes downhill from there. And the defense just starts coming to loose at the seams. That's why sometimes we do not have gap control. It's because of the lack of trust. No trust, no team. No team, it's probably because there's no trust. And that happens a lot. That's a big one. That is the trust, the lack of trust, I should say, is the unseen enemy. And it is the downfall and the death of most defenses. That's the truth. Number two, why is it that athletes do not maintain gap control? Eye discipline. They might trust the guy next to them. It may not be a trust factor, but they don't have good eye discipline. If the B gap is my gap, why am I peaking in the A? If the C gap is my gap, why am I peaking in the B? If my eyes are all over, then it's very hard to maintain the leverage, gap leverage, body leverage of what's in front of me. I can only maintain my gap if I can maintain my gap leverage. I can only maintain my gap if I can maintain my hip and my hat. Is my hip and hat in the crack? If I can't maintain my posture, if I cannot maintain my position, I'm probably going to lose my gap. Why am I losing my gap? Because I'm not identifying that the guy in front of me is moving. I'm not seeing that he has now relocated because my eyes are someplace else. Why would my coach line me up in the B gap and I peek in the A? Why? Why would I be lined up in the C gap or the D gap and I peek in the A, I peek in the B. I'm looking all the way inside, as opposed to allowing the guy in front of me to tell me where the flow of the ball is going. That happens so much. There's so much bad eye discipline out there on all levels. Why? Because I want to be the one to make the play. I want to be the one to make the tackle. I want to be the one to make the sack. I want to be the one to make the TFL. I want to shine, as opposed to holding my point of the try. It's so much of that. And yes, there's the peak, there's the punch and peak drill. But the punch and peak drill is you're supposed to punch and peak in your gap. But guess what? The running back is most of the time, not even most of the time, not nowadays, but the running back is either behind the center in a, in a pistol, um, behind the quarterback in pistol. He might be offset right or offset left. And when that running back is not directly in my gap, that's not enough information for me, so I peek elsewhere. And that's where we lose our gap maintenance. That's where we do not maintain our gap 
because I'm trying to track the back. Why are we trying to track the back? Well, coach, how am I supposed to make the tackle if I don't track the back? Well, if the back ain't coming in your gap, are you going to leave your gap to track the back and make the tackle? If, the, if your answer is yes, that's not discipline. You're not holding your point of the try. All you need to know is that you have a role and a responsibility within the defense and it's bigger than you and the defense is depending upon you to hold your point of the triangle. I know it's not the fanciest. I know you may not always be celebrated, but if you hold your point of the try and you trust the guy next to you and now we got more team play, most of the time everybody's going to eat. Most of the time everybody is going to eat. Because guess what? In playoffs, you're still playing. Right? Division championships, you playing. You still playing, big dog. Championship games, you still playing. You still eating because you played as a team. But sometimes we have bad eye discipline. When we lose track of what we're attacking, we lose our gaps. When we lose track of what we're attacking, we lose our gaps. How many offenses nowadays, the offensive line stays still? They don't move. All these zone concepts, split zones, inside zones, uh, wide zones, all these zones that they got, plunges, all these different kind of offenses that are going now, powers, counters, these offensive linemen are moving. And if, and if you want to look in the backfield and try to track the back, you are going to lose track of the guy that's in front of you. And the guy that's in front of you is really telling you the flow of the ball. It's him. He's telling you where the flow of the ball is going, yet your eyes are trying to track the back. And when you are trying to track the back, who might be five yards back, seven yards back, he's put back there as a dangling carrot. He's put back there to get you to look and peek and say, follow me, while those offensive linemen at the line of scrimmage are moving and maneuvering you and, and relocating those gaps that you're supposed to be in because you're trying to track the back. Don't worry about tracking no back, especially as a defensive lineman. You better track the offensive lineman. You better track where they are going. You better make sure you maintain your gap. You can't maintain your gap if your eyes are trying to track the back, you better look at the guy that's in front of you, get your hands on him and play him, play them that's in front of you. Because if you're getting a double team, if you're getting a reach block, if you're getting a down block, is that not telling you where the running back is going? If you get a down, down and a backside guard pulling, is that not telling you where the running back is going? Why do I have to peek over my hands, peek around my hands, peek under my hands, why, why do I have to do that instead of looking at my hands and looking at what's in my hands and looking at where my hands are moving and allowing that to dictate where the back is going? Let that help you track the back. These offensive linemen nowadays, they are the new fullbacks in most cases, depending on formation. They're the new fullbacks. So wherever they're going, most of the time, they are leading the backs. They're telling you where the backs are going. But we don't see it that way. So we have bad eye discipline. Eyes are everywhere. If an offensive coordinator can get your eyes everywhere, then he can, he can execute his scheme at the line of scrimmage because your eyes are everywhere except where they should be. I told one of my pro guys one time, when you're trying to see everything, you are seeing nothing. But it's when you see one thing that you can see everything. When you can have great eye discipline and you can allow that one thing to help you see everything and understand everything, that's when you're playing football. But when you're trying to see everything, it's so hard to identify the one thing that you're trying to figure out. That's how offenses are set up. They want you to see motion. They want you to see um, 
running back stepping left, coming back right, running back stepping right, coming back left, the running back's right, he zones left, then bends back right. I mean, it's so much zigzagging sometimes that's happening. Down, down, backside guards pulling, a waggle or a buck sweep. I meant to say buck sweep, both guards are pulling. It's so much movement going on that if you're trying to see everything, most likely you ain't seeing nothing, big dog. You have to have great eye discipline. You've got to be able to look at what's in front of you and allow that to help you track the back. So one of the reasons why, the second reason why we do not maintain our gap control is because we have bad eye discipline. Our eyes are all over. You should be looking through your hands. Whatever you're trying to see, your hands are almost like telescopes. They're like binoculars, and I'm looking through my hands. If I'm not looking through my hands, I'm looking at too much. Your hands will zoom in, okay? Your hands will help you zoom in on what you should be looking at, at least for four steps, at least for four steps, your first four, sometimes two, sometimes one, if the tackle is blocking down your DN, right? So then now my eyes have to see if action goes away, what's coming back at me. But in most cases, at least for four steps, I should be looking through my hands. See your strike. See your strike. If I can force my eyes to be disciplined and I can look through my hands, that will tell me all I need to know. And that will help me maintain my gap. Eyes can't be everywhere. Trying to see everything, you ain't going to see one thing. If you focus on one thing, you'll see everything. That's number two. Number three. There's a quote that I wrote, and I love referring to it. I love thinking about it because uh, it's very important in football and in life. It goes like this. When you learn how to work as a team, that's when you've learned the art of playing football. But if you choose to work alone, then now you're only priding football. There's a difference between playing football and priding football. Playing football entails learning the art and the significance of how 11 guys, 11 athletes on the field, football field, can play as one. How do you get 11 individuals to function as one body? That's crucial. But when you have 11 different guys doing 11 different things that have no cohesiveness or that have no relations to the other, then you're not playing as a team. Everybody's doing their own thing. That's priding football. How many plays did I make? As in tackles, tax, interceptions, all that stuff. And I'm not saying it's bad to pursue that. But you will get that within the scheme of the team, within the scheme of the defense. That will come if you first play your role. If you first play your role, that will come. Team over me, not me over team. To me, there's a difference, big dog, between unity and uniformity. In my opinion, uniformity can mean we look the same. We have the same uniform, same colors, same logos, we look the same, but it does not mean that we are the same. Unity means we are the same. We are one in objective. We are one in mission. We are one in function. We are one. When you are un, when you have unity, when you have become one, you have sacrificed and you've made your role important and you're playing your role in regards to the team, the scheme of the team, 
Now you see unity. Now you see functioning as one. But when you are playing alone, which to me means all one, when you think that you are alone or all one, you think that you can do this alone. Now there is no unity. There's just uniformity. Uniforms don't win games. Just because we have the same socks, same colors, same school, same logo, that doesn't guarantee anything. And we know that. Now, it starts with uniformity. It, it helps to be uniformed. But if that's where you end, and even though we have the same uniform, we are different in objectives, different in mission, different in function. I don't know how many games we're actually going to win as a team. And that's where we lose more than gaps. We lose more than gap control. We lose leverage. We've lost discipline. We've lost trust. We've lost unity. It's a mess. And I know some teams out there, it's a mess. Because though we look the same, there's nothing in sync about us. There's nothing joining us together at all. It looked good. D linemen in their stance, linebackers in their stance, DBs where they're supposed to be, pre snap, safeties. It, it looked good. It looked formed. Everybody's in position. But when the ball snaps, when the when the when the offensive play is in play, and then that's when you really see what a defensive player believes about themselves and about their teammates and about their coaches. Because it's different when you know what to do. You know what to do. You've been told what to do. You've been told what your role is within the scheme. But it's different when you don't choose it. Just because you know it doesn't mean you choose it. Knowing it is half the battle. Choosing it is where it takes sacrifice. And when that offensive play is in play and everybody starts moving around, that's when you really see, are you just, are you a team by uniform or are you a team by unity? Hmm. Are you a team by uniform? Or are you a team by unity? And to be honest with you, teams that look like a team by uniform, most of the time the scoreboard show you wasn't no team at all. I told you, games, when they are played, they're asking one question. Which team is a team? And if we don't have trust, we don't have a team. Not saying good things ain't going to happen. But at the end of the game or at the end of the season, it's going to tell you. Most of the time it's going to tell you which real teams were out there. Talking about gap control, talking about maintaining your gap, it has a lot more to do with trust than anything else. This is Coach Roll with Big Dog Trench Talk, and we talk in trenches week in and week out. This was a very important topic because it led to an identify with a lot more things other than just technique. Is your team a team? <laughs> All right, big dog. You know what time it is, baby. Let's go to work.